you know, give this update. And um, the background image here is actually an MS cubed mosaic that we've made in the last couple of weeks. Um, the overlaid positions with the red circles are the NBSS um, positions um, greater than 5 millijansky. So we're doing pretty well, we think, with this shallow survey. Um, so I'll begin just by reminding you of the motivation and the setup of the survey. And uh, I'll um, describe to you in a bit more detail a couple of the, the things that Ronald mentioned about the, the pipeline uh, structure that we built for the imaging pipeline. And I'll, I'll focus, um, in particular, a bit on beam testing, for one thing, which Ronald also mentioned, and also on the calibration and imaging steps that we're doing. And I'll end with some, some pictures. So uh, not long after the Callum last year, we had a, a science meeting in the Netherlands about MOFAR. And at that time, we, um, we asked for participation from all of the, the key science projects in MOFAR. This is Michael Wise acting as, uh, as Uncle Sam. For those of you who don't need the project scientist, MOFAR. So we uh, we asked for participation from all the EOR from all of the KSPs, including the EOR, and uh, uh, came up with a, a group of about 50 people, of which some are shown here, that have all uh, grouped together. We're sort of informally calling them MS Cubed Army, which um, all contribute time to participating to the commissioning effort of the of the survey. Uh, so I'm speaking on their behalf, really. OK, so we're doing the survey for a few reasons. The first is because we want to have a broadband um, low-frequency all-sky catalog. Uh, so we wanted to have spectral information from all of the sources, uh, all the bright sources in the sky between 30 and 160 megahertz, uh, which will supplement uh, VLSS, WENTS, and VSS. And also there's the TGSS, which is the um, GMRT 150 megahertz survey, which is, I think they just had their fifth data release a couple days ago. Um, they're starting in the south, so declinations lower than zero, and moving northward. Um, so that's not soon enough for us, in fact. Um, but it will when they when their data release is complete, then we'll have um, all of that information to overlap with what we have as well. Uh, but anyway, the, the point is for our survey to cover this whole range, and we do that in two shots, as I'll show you. Uh, the other thing is to develop the, the pipeline um, to make the automatic pipeline function because the imaging observations that we do with LOFAR easily go into the terabytes. And if you use 8-bit mode, as well described, or even 4-bit mode, then you're easily over 10 terabytes for a normal imaging observation. So it's inconceivable that you could download the data to your laptop and do something with it. So there has to be some pre-processing at least. And that's what we wanted to do, was to make sure that we had all of the automatic steps taken care of. And to, and to drive the priorities of the developments from a practical point of view, to make sure that we had the right steps in place. And then finally, to stress test the system as we were developing it to make sure that we could schedule all the observations and push them through without major problems. So the survey was set up in, in two pieces, the, the low band part and the high band part. Um, each, each mode um, runs with eight uh, bands, each of two megahertz simultaneously. Uh, each, each band is a fifth of a megahertz, so it's 10, 10 subbands grouped together in eight chunks simultaneously. Um, which span 30 to 75 in the LBA, with one of them overlapping the VLSS band. Um, and in the HBA, 120 to 160, with one of the bands overlapping the GMRT um, band that they're using for TGSS. Uh, we do two uh, fields simultaneously in the LBA, <clears throat> plus a calibrator. As Ronald mentioned, the calibrator is done in parallel with the observations in a low band. Now that we have 8-bit mode, we're going to shift to doing five fields plus a calibrator simultaneously, all with uh, 8 times 2 megahertz. In the high band, we have three simultaneous targets, which will now become six with 8-bit mode. And the calibrator is done uh, in serial instead of in parallel. For the LBA, we do nine snapshots to in increase the UV coverage. We only do two for the HBA because we're doing primarily just the core um, to begin with for the initial processing. So the instantaneous UV coverage is very good. For the LBA, it's 11-minute snapshots, and for the HBA, it's 7-minute snapshots. So it's 660 fields in total for LBA. across That covers the entire sky north of declination zero. Um, and for the HBA, it's 3,500 fields, basically. And though it uses these modes, and the initial processing will be, uh, this was to save computing costs, uh, which I think this is now greatly reduced, actually, that effect. Uh, the LBA initially will process the 10-kilometer baselines and less, and for the HBA, 3 kilometers, which is basically the core area. Now that we have the new imager, and that's something that Cyril will talk about in detail, um, 
I think that these restrictions can be restricted, can be reduced greatly. So we'll actually be able to do higher resolution imaging. Um, but I think in order to do the first release, we'll stick to a relatively low resolution uh, survey to get the first release out, and then we'll do a higher uh, second release, higher resolution second release after that. Okay, so this is just illustrating the the, uh, the pointing grids. We just space. Um, I think this has been done before for other surveys as well. We just space the fields equally on uh, declination strips, like so. So we're covering everything north of declination zero, as I mentioned. Uh, the sensitivities are, are shown here. These are recently measured uh, SEFD curves for the, the low band over here and the high band over here. Um, you can think of the SEFD at around 60 megahertz of being about 20 kilojansky per station. Uh, in, the, in the high band, it's more like one or two kilojansky, depending on whether it's a core station or a remote station. And that leads to, uh, per two megahertz band in the low band, an expected third well. Uh, and in principle, the thermal noise is about 10 millijansky, and in the high band, it's about 2 millijansky. Uh, that's per 2 megahertz band, as I mentioned. Uh, we're not getting these numbers. So we get several times the, the thermal noise, typically, in MS cubed images. That's because we're not doing very detailed calibration and imaging. We're doing rather rudimentary calibration and imaging for this survey. So how do those numbers stack up in comparison? These are basically the thermal noise uh, estimates. So you can imagine that these push up by a factor of a few typically, uh, to be honest. So uh, we, in, the, in the low band, we easily get to, per 2 megahertz band, we end up with a sensitivity which is consistent with VLSS sensitivity of about 100 millijansky per beam. And with the HBA, I think we're going to match TGSS. So we're only really be just beginning the HBA testing now. Um, but we're very easily getting good, good quality HBA images without any effort. Um, because, of course, the atmospheric effects are much reduced at this frequency than in the low band. So for the, for the uh, low band part of the survey, we're about 80% done with the observations. The processing is, of course, uh, less advanced than that. We've been doing a lot of handwork to make sure we understand the, the uh, calibration steps that we have to follow. Uh, for the HBA, we've basically just started. Uh, so you can consider that 0% done in terms of observations, but plenty of testing has been done. This is a site, msqueb.astron.nl, that you can use to track the observations that are being done. Um, that gives a lot of information, most of, most of which is just useful for the commissioners. It tells, tells them which observation IDs um, have been done for each snapshot and this sort of thing. It's sort of a, um, a database of observation information. It will be extended at some point to give a postage stamp server as well. So you can sort of see where the, the field pages, you know, each of these fields has its own page. And that will be extended at some point to give postage stamps and, and catalog entries. At the moment, that's not public information. Okay, so here's the uh, here's the pipeline which Ronald mentioned. Um, just to get break it up a little bit more, um, the top part is the is what we call the calibrator pipeline. Uh, that's what does the initial calibration of the calibrator uh, beam. Then there's the part that does the pre-processing of the of the target observations, and then there's the target imaging pipeline, um, which does the imaging and the uh, in principle the self calibration. Uh, sorry, the uh, major cycle, which uh, as Ronald said isn't done yet. To clarify one thing, we actually do a, a peeling step before the, before the self column. That's not applying a, a phase screen or something, at least not yet. Um, but it does take care of the direction dependent effects from the, from the off axis sources, the bright off axis sources. And that's because without having done that step, the, the first model that you extract from the, from the first image is quite bad, in fact. And so it wouldn't be useful as a, as a self column model. <coughs> okay. Uh, the, the processing time is typically about consistent with the observing time of the HBA if it's far from the A-team sources, so you don't have to demix. And it's about twice the observing time in the LBA. We always demix in the LBA, so I'll show you. And if you want to add the peeling step, then it adds another factor of one, basically. Um, so this would become twice the observing time for HBA and three times for the LBA, give or take. And that's dominated by the demixing and the peeling. So the, R the RFI statistics Ronald has already mentioned are typically just a couple of percent. There's some bad bands, especially in the HBA. There's some particular bands which are have very high RFI occupancy, and we avoid those bands, especially in MSQ where we have just spread out chunks of, of bandwidth. We can avoid these known uh, trouble bands. We demix in the in the LBA. We always demix Cygnus and Cas, no matter what, and that's because we always find um, these interference patterns between the two. Those are the two brightest sources. 
um, you can always see this. This is a, actually a calibrator observation. This is 3C196. And this is a, a short baseline, relatively short baseline. This is about a tenth of a kilolambda, if I remember right. So you can see the strong interference pattern. Without removing all of that, you'll never calibrate this field. So when we, when we remove um, the A-team sources with the mixing, then you can get a, a stable calibration solution. And you'll see that in a bit. Uh, I, th I showed this last time, but it's, it just illustrates the, um, uh, the, the power of doing this demixing step. We had an observation of Hydra, which is 130 degrees away from CAS. And after doing demixing, we were able to image um, CAS using the demixed data, where the telescope was pointing 130 degrees away. So we can get this signal out of the Hydra observation. And this is still not a great image, because it's rather low declination for, for low far. But, but still, it illustrates that you can get rid of the bright sources, the far off axis bright sources. OK, now the calibration is done with, with a set of uh, primary flux calibrators um, <coughs> using this lovely paper. So we get uh, from, from those observations, we get these stable uh, gain solutions that are shown over here. This is amplitude for a number of stations. Of course, you can't read the numbers, but the, the RMS is typically 10% or less, which for the LBA is, is quite good given the very high system temperature of the observations. Um, but it also illustrates why we have to do long um, ampli why we have to do long uh, calibration. We can't just do a snapshot calibration, get a solution and apply it to a long target observation because the the, uh, the solutions aren't stable enough for these sources. So we need to have a long term observation. For the snapshots in MS cubed, it just turns out it's most effective to just you know do the do the calibration in parallel with the target, get the the amplitude solution, um, and apply it to the to the target. It's by far the most efficient way to do it. Do you find that the uh, calibrator observations in low band actually help? I, I would have guessed that they wouldn't be terribly useful. Uh, they, though they do help. You mean it as opposed to just assuming a number or something? Like that. Well, what we've done with the VLA is typically calibrate the instrument and presume that the instrument is stable enough and, and then <coughs> observe the, the target field. Yeah. And if we, mm. say, looked at a, a calibrator 10 degrees away, it stays would be basically uncorrelated with what was going on with the target. Oh, sorry. This is only for amplitude. So the phase, we, oh, okay. we don't use these phases at all. They're completely rubbish for the, for the target. OK, that's what I'm looking for. Right. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. So this is actually zooming into one of those stations. So we actually end up with a couple of outlier amplitudes that we toss. But this is all we keep is just the amplitude. So coming back to this diagram, in fact, um, when we do this part here, um, the calibration parameters are applied are indeed just the amplitude. And then the phase is actually, this actually doesn't show up in the diagram, so we should add that. <laughs> but uh, somewhere the. Uh, um, well, there's basically an extra step in here which is missing, which is that the, a model from uh, from VLSS or WENTS, uh, depending if we're using low band or high band, is used to derive a phase only solution. And that's what's used to initially phase calibrate the, the array. OK, now these combine in a complicated way because we have multiple beams per snapshot and multiple snapshots per field. Um, so this is why the, the pipeline has to, has to be somewhat complicated, because it has to do all the bookkeeping to make sure that the the pieces are stuck together on the right way. But each calibrator calibrates um, m target observations. There's m beams per observation. And then the various snapshots are combined into single fields. So in the case of LBA, there's n, n equals 9 and m equals 2 or 5. And for the HBA, n equals 2 and m equals 3 or 6. Um, and then this is all fed into the imaging pipeline. And then that closed, then eventually goes into the global sky model after the source extraction is done. Now, the, the imaging pipeline uses, as I mentioned, the AW Imager now, which is the, the, the software that Cyril and others have, have produced. Um, and so one of the, the fundamental things for that is the, um, the, uh, the station beams um, in low part. And so to measure those, we've been using a technique that we call beam mapping, which is not quite holography, but almost. We don't have the holography mode implemented yet for low part. Um, so we, uh, we observe um, Cygnus with a bunch of beams simultaneously, a 15 by 15 grid of, of beams surrounding Cygnus. Uh, these are normal interferometric observations. We have full, a full set of visibilities, baseline visibilities, for all of those 225 simultaneous beams. 
And because Cygnus is such a bright source, it dominates the visibility function for all of those beams, even if you're pointing 20 degrees away. So what we do is just a normal calibration, no frills, just a normal calibration on Cygnus. We have a very good model of Cygnus by now. Um, and using that, we end up with uh, station gains. These are all simultaneously observed, obviously, so there's no time variation to worry about. Um, so we have 225 simultaneous gain matrices for all of the stations. And we just interpret those directly as, as the beam response of the, uh, of the telescope. So this is a, a good beam, so to speak. The white boxes here are just subbands which failed for some reason. Um, but it's showing this is a 40 degree by 40 degree box. This is the, the X response, the Y response, and the cross polarization response. So we do that for, um, for, of course, you get all the stations, because as I said, it's a normal calibration. This is at 60 megahertz. Um, we, Earlier in the year, identified bad stations in that way. This was one of the bad stations. So it turned out that this one didn't have a calibration table, I think, at the station level. Um, we also, this was one of the pieces of evidence that pointed to the problem that we needed the, the sync optics board uh, that Ronald mentioned to solve. <coughs> so using this technique, we've been able to map the, the beam size as a function of frequency and find the, uh, the scaling between lambda over d and the beam size, basically. So for HBA, this is exactly the number you would expect for a filled aperture. For the LBA, it's, it's more of a sparse um, aperture, and so you end up with a larger um, uh, alpha factor here. We also actually use it to map the, the grading lobes for HBA. Um, so this is the, for a number of different HBA stations, this is illustrating the rotation of that particular station. And these are the grading lobes due to the, the regular layout of the, of the tiles in, within the station. So this is the on, this is the on axis pointing, so to speak. And this is, uh, again, a 40 by 40 degree field showing the, the, the powerful grading lobe response of the tile to tile um, separation. So this is why the stations are all rotated in, in, uh, at different orientations. Because if they were all at the same orientation, then if there was a, any sources sitting inside the grading lobe, you'd get it at the full strength. Modulo the analog beam inside the tile, but okay, that's that gives you a huge, you know, 20, 25 degree beam. So that's not uh, that's not going to help to suppress the first grading lobe at any at any rate. Um, and then finally, uh, we had done this observation in the low band. This is 30 megahertz. This beam. Um, if you're paying attention, you'll realize that the the beams are in the in the wrong boxes here. That this is X and Y, and these are cross polarization. But that's where all the signal is. And it turned out this was because of uh, differential ferritin rotation. So this is a, a remote station. And as you go to higher frequencies, you see the signal go into the uh, parallel response, so to speak. And if you measure you know, how much of the, of the signal is leaked into the cross polarization as a function of frequency, it, it follows exactly a lambda squared pattern, which means it's ferritin rotation. And so this was a ferritin rotation, a differential ferritin rotation of just a couple, couple hundredths of a radian per meter squared between this remote station and the core stations. OK, now I have a couple minutes George, to show. Yeah. So here, the further rotation doesn't seem to be direction dependent. It's like a constant across the field. Well, <laughs> um, that's, well, keep in mind that the, this is always observing Cygnus, right? So in that sense, it's only one pierce point through the atmosphere. Right? You're observing it in multiple directions simultaneously with respect to the beam. Do you see it? So you have scenes at one location, and then I mean, it's always it's always in the same spot, right? And you, you point the telescope in a bunch of places, but you're always looking at the same spot through the atmosphere. So how long is each pixel? Well, apart from the distance, apart from the distance between the station, you're looking through the same atmosphere. See what I'm saying? So in terms of altas, it's a difference from one pixel to another. For the same station, no, it's always the same location. The, the beam is pointing differently. Right, we can, I can describe it later. The beam is always pointing differently, but the, the pierce point to the source is always the same because the source is just in one place. OK, so let me show a couple of images. This is um, an LBA field. This is a, a single field. This is the full moon up here, if you can even see it. This is uh, 15 by 15 degrees. Um, this is several bands combined, in fact. Um, th so this is just a few tenths a few tens of Lilijansky per beam noise <coughs> combined. As I said, per band, it's roughly similar to BLSS uh, noise, about 100 Lilijansky per day. Uh, 
there's a little fuzzy blob over here which turns out to be a nearby galaxy um, that's shown there. And uh, we also have some, of course, there's observations in the galactic plane. This is an image that was done producing, I think, produced with natural weighting. And so the image quality isn't so great, but you can see that we're picking up a lot of um, uh, diffuse structure in the, in the galactic plane. The contours here are the Wentz, uh, the Wentz image. So there's some of the diffuse structure we're not picking up. This is probably thermal emission, and this is non-thermal. Um, but in any case, we're picking up a lot of diffuse structure, not just from the, from the Milky Way, but also from nearby galaxies, for instance. Now, we can also combine the, uh, the different bands within the survey in such a way that we can actually get spectral information. So this is a map showing, for every source within this field, how many bands that source was detected in. So keep in mind there's eight bands in the LBA survey, eight bands in the HBA survey. So for the LBA part alone, uh, all of the red sources here were detected in all eight bands with you know, more than an octave of, uh, of frequency coverage. So you can use that if they're bright enough to get a, a reliable spectral index just within the, with, just within the low band. Um, and this was, in fact, one of, the, one of the purposes of the survey. And so this is showing the spectral index distribution for 500 sources um, from several fields combined showing a, a, a median spectral index which is consistent with what we know of the, of the radio sky, more or less, and a, a broad um, distribution. Some of these sources are probably rubbish. Um, they're probably on the faint end that perhaps should not have been fitted. But this is just a work in progress. We're figuring out how to get reliable broadband information out of the survey. And then to show a, an HBA test, we did three, uh, three fields just recently. This is the position of Cygnus. We did one set of fields near Cygnus to make sure we wouldn't, wouldn't be in trouble um, with, with a nearby very bright source. Uh, this is the, uh, what we're calling the MSQ verif verification field, just because we spent so much time on it in a low band. And this is the Lockman Hole area, where there's no bright sources. So this is sort of the, the easiest field um, to work with, more or less. Uh, these are, are typical HBA images. So you, you can see that this is done with, with the primary beam correction um, in place. These images are coming out extremely fast now with the new version of the, of the imager that Sarah will describe. So we're, we're very happy with this imager. Uh, and this is, these were produced, I wanted to point out, these are only, only using automatic processing. Uh, so there's no, no handcrafting going on. Uh, extended source. This is a mosaic that we, we did, a three by three mosaic that we did uh, using the output of the, of the imager. Uh, and uh, just comparing it with a low bound field, this is just a single pointing of the LBA, and this is a three by three grid of, of HBA pointings comparing to the same field. I'm running out of time, but uh, in, this is just showing the effect of peeling in the HBA. So this is after, before, and after peeling. You can see these, these bright sources. Um, some of the artifacts around them go away. In the LBA, the effect is, of course, much more dramatic. And uh, I think this is just about to last. This is the mosaic of the 3x3 three three field uh, grid near, near Cygnus. So uh, this, this field seems to also be in good shape. Yeah, good question. Um, I think it's about 10 millijansky, but I'll, I'll tell you later on. I've forgotten exactly. It's an order 10. Anyway. This is coming from 3 times 14 minutes of observation, which is, Chris, 42 minutes. <laughs> Um, the, what we're doing is comparing the fluxes of these sources with, the, with expectations from the catalog. In the, in the southern part of this grid, we actually have large amplitude errors. We think this is because of deconvolution. We didn't do the deconvolution properly in, these, in this part of the mosaic, but otherwise we're typically at about a 10% give or take uh, flux uncertainty, which I think is what, we, what, you, what, you, what you could expect. And this is my last slide. The, uh, one of the, the nice things that we get from MS Cubed is also nice uh, transient search capability. And in particular, with the LBA, where you can point anywhere simultaneously on the sky, we always have one beam on the North Celestial Pole with every observation. So we now have, as you can see, if you go to the MS Cubed website, you can see that NCP has been observed 3,000 times now. So this is a, a combined image that's confusion limited um, of the NCP from all of those snapshots combined. This gives. Um, you know, you can make light curves of the brighter sources in here with a with a, a extremely high cadence and over several months. Um, so this is is going to be a, a very nice uh, transient tool. Okay. That's all. Thanks.
the mechanics of how you do the data reduction. I mean, you, you log in remotely into the into the cluster, and, uh, and what happens then? You have to bring up a GUI. You know, you have a command line interface. Mm -hmm. How does the how does it work? In principle, the pipeline does it all for you. So, in principle, you you tell the telescope observe this part of the sky, right. and it just tags on an imaging pipeline at the end, and, and you, you get an image. image. In reality, at the moment, what really happens is that you um, you have some um, some handwork to do. So we basically have our handcrafted Python scripts, which do pieces of the imaging pipeline, but they're automatically distributed. So you know all of these steps are are distributed over this hundred core, uh, sorry, hundred node cluster. So in the pre-processing steps, you have um, sets of eighty subbands, which are spread out over the cluster. Yeah. So you've you've got twenty percent of the cluster, which is idle. Um, and 80% okay. is being used on the different subbands. And then you combine, this is all done automatically. The, the subbands are combined into um, chunks of 10. Uh, and then you're using eight nodes at once to do the imaging steps, basically. But anyway, the, 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 the parallel processing part of it is all controlled by some, some master program that the user doesn't have to deal with. Yeah. So how, do you, how do you know what to do with the ad steps? You get feedback. Oh, that, that's that's what this group of Christians was for. Was to was to test out different options. You know how you should deal with the different pieces and, and the exact algorithms. Um, so that's all done with handwork, okay. with with you know just command line stuff. Okay. 